Cool. So um, the past year or so, I was working as a part-time security analyst at WordFence. Um, I've now moved over into a full-time senior developer role there, but I'm hoping for the next half hour or so to tell you some stories, some of the things that I learned, some of the things that I saw while doing site cleaning at WordFence. Um, and just on a side note, I tried to get them to sponsor, but we couldn't make it happen. But I do have a pile of swag, um, and so I've got some swag quiz questions throughout the talk, so first answer can come back and get some swag, and I've got some extras as well. Um, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so it's the first question that gets asked is why site cleaning? You know, why, why do, why look at malware, why clean infected websites when there are other things to be doing? And the answer is pretty simple, it's curiosity. I've been doing security for a number of years now, usually in the defending your site scenario, you know, installing, you know, setting up security headers and worrying about cross site scripting and all that sort of thing, but I hadn't done any actual malware analysis or cleaning infected websites or looking at any of that sort of thing. And when I was looking for a part-time job, I stumbled across the job ad and thought, that sounds like fun, you know, looking at malware, that sounds like a great idea, I'd never seen it before, I thought it could be interesting. And so I signed up for the job. Um, now the job application started off as a standard application, you answer some questions and you send in your resume. But there was also a second component which was they gave an SSH credential, so the IP address, username and password, and an infected website was there and had to clean it. And so I had seven days to clean an infected WordPress website um, as part of the job application. And I'd never actually done it before in my life. My WordPress experience was you know, copying the files to a server and running the install script and maybe installing some plugins from the repo. I hadn't done any WordPress coding. Um, I hadn't looked at any actual PHP malware or any malware before, so I really had no idea what I was doing. So like any good IT person, the first thing I did was Google. <laughs> so it's a good place to start. There are heaps and heaps of things online about um, cleaning up hacked web, web, um, WordPress sites. So a lot of the big vendors have heaps of documentation. WordFence have got heaps. Security have got heaps. Um, some things are more marketing based than others. A lot of the vendors will try and sell you into their site cleaning or into their site products. Um, but there's still heaps up there and there's a whole bunch of independent researchers that have got information as well and videos as you can see. So that's a great place to start. So I spent a couple of hours just looking through that, figuring out you know, what I'm looking for, you know, where to start, what to do. And so when, I've, when I thought I had enough information, I moved on and the first thing I did when I logged into the server was back up everything. And the biggest reason for this was I didn't want to break something and have to go, oh guys, I accidentally deleted the wrong file and it's all broken, can you fix it so I can go and clean the malware again? That would be really embarrassing and you know, instant fail. But also, if I failed the application, I wanted to keep the code so I could look at it again, because I refer back to curiosity. I wanted to see, you know, if, if I missed something, what did I miss? Um, and so I backed up all the files, all the databases, everything I could find that I could back up on that server, I backed up. And once I'd done that, then I was, went looking for malware. So, Step three, and the theme in a lot of these, is look for anything strange, or anything that's unusual. And if you're very familiar with the WordPress code base, you'll know what's familiar and what's not. So if we look at this, direct, this file listing, for example, anything in there stands out strange. Is there any? Thank you. So up here, actually, next slide better. Don't be hello. So that one is unusual for three reasons. First of all, the name. That's not a core file. You don't find that on a call install. Secondly, the date. Everything else is 30th of May. That one is, what, the 25th of September. Why has it got a different date? And that file size, this one here is the file size. It's tiny. Um, everything else is bigger. So that file from memory, uh, PHP open tag, eval, get parameter. So it's just a remote code execution. And that's, it's far too small. So you know that's instant red flag. That's something you've got to look at. Um, and so I spent a decent amount of time looking through, you know, the, the plugins and the things, look for anything unusual, anything that shouldn't exist. Um, given my limited knowledge of WordPress, I, you know, downloaded fresh copies of everything to have a look to see what there was. Once I'd done that, I'd found what I could, I thought, why not, I'll install WordFence. So I installed WordFence on the, on the WordPress site and I ran a scanner. It found a whole bunch of stuff to delete, um, a whole bunch of modified files, and went through all of its recommendations and cleaned up the site through that. And I kept the backup, but I didn't need it. I didn't, man I didn't break anything, so that was quite good. So after using WordFence and cleaning up that, the next thing was to look at the database. So um, the databases have, you know, if they've infected the site and infected the database, you generally find a bunch of suspicious keywords. So 
um, big thing for database is SEO injection, um, when you want SEO spam. And so you'll have the, the standard um, information that they're, they're trying to put, you know, the site content, um, but you'll also have hidden links hiding inside it. So if you can look in that one, it's the highlighted bits, are hidden links that won't show up when you're reading the content, but they're there, and this one's linking to um, a cheap pharmacy website to try and get its rankings to raise up. And there's a whole bunch of words that you'll generally find when you're looking for this sort of thing. So, you know, Viagra, porn, callus, weight loss, casino, you know, et cetera, et cetera, it goes on. Um, and unless you're cleaning, say, a pharmacy website, you won't find these terms on a normal site. And I know from experience, cleaning a pharmacy website when it's been affected with SEO spam is really, really hard because you don't know what's actual legitimate content and what's not. <laughs> Luckily, you know, you can find like the, the, the position app, so it's throwing it far off to the left of the screen. And that's a dead giveaway. But sometimes it's not so obvious, and you've got to make a judgment call, you know, is this site actually selling Viagra, or is it a fake spam site set up? Um, so that, that's always a fun one. Um, yeah, so they're the, the basic steps that I went through um, to clean the site. Um, and it turns out that they're, you know, the steps that you kind of need to follow. Um, I actually managed to get 100% on this, on this application, which was quite nice, um, considering I'd never cleaned a site before. So I was very happy with that one. Um, and throughout my years as cleaning websites, this is basically the steps that we always follow. So, you know, that's something to remember if you're interested in cleaning sites or have to clean a site, is those steps. Now, I glossed over it a little bit, but all they gave me were the SSH credentials, so I could log into the SSH account on the server. But how did I get into the WordPress admin in order to install the plugin and use the scanner? No, use something else. No. Close. I, I didn't create a user, but I did something similar. Yes, change the password. <laughs> yeah, so WordPress passwords. Um, by default, they're assaulted. Um, you can see at the top there, those three at the top, that's the same password hash three times. Um, and the salt in the, in the hash function means that the output is different. Um, I'm not going to go into the reasons why. If you're interested, come find me later. But the bottom three is MD5 hash of the same password. And as you can see, the output is the same. And so what you'll often find, and sorry, WordPress, if the password is stored as an MD5, it'll understand it. So if you try to log in, it will let you log in with that password. Then it'll save it itself at hashed version. So if you've got access to the database, which I did, then you can simply go into the user's table, change the password. And we'll quite often find when cleaning a site that the user passwords have been changed to MD5 hashes. And so when the attacker can get into the database, they'll upset, they'll change all the passwords to their own passwords using MD5 hash, and they can get log in as soon as, you know, to the actual admin, admin account and do whatever they want, which makes it very easy to gain access to WordPress if you have access to the database. Does anyone know what that MD5 is? Password. Yeah, password. <laughs> you need to get in up with all the swag over there. <laughs> all good. Okay, so um, the first thing that I, that I encountered when I started working as a site cleaner was this vulnerability. Um, it was the start of last year. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers it, but it was a vulnerability in the API where it was incorrectly um, authorizing the user using a non-strict um, comparison. And so it allowed anyone who had access to the site, regardless of you know, their, their user privileges, whatever else, just a guest, could modify post, post content, page content by the API. So they, WordPress quietly fixed it on the 26th of January last year, and then six days later, after they decided there'd been enough updates, enough um, sites had updated the latest version, then they disclosed the vulnerability. I assume the idea was they wanted to announce it, let people know about it so that it could be protected, rather than just let it linger and wait for someone to discover it. The problem was it was trivial to automate because it's an API call. And heaps and heaps of sites had disabled or broken updates. And so heaps of sites weren't updated and were vulnerable to this. And so we saw a huge influx of site cleaners come in from this because of all the sites that, as I said, had disabled updates or broken updates. Um, luckily, it's trivial to clean because it's all in the database and all it gave access to was editing page and post content. So all we had to do was run a script. We had a couple of internal scripts to run, just upload it, and then it would um, clear out the post, because the um, attackers were using very similar sorts of cylinders of what they're injecting in. So easy to clean, but it was still hitting a lot of sites. And so the takeaway here really is keep updates happening and don't disable them, whatever you do. Um, if you have to modify core, then rethink what you're trying to do, because if you have to disable updates, you've got a problem. 
And so accessing a database can be incredibly trivial. Um, we discovered one time that a number of, we were seeding a number of sites and they all had a very similar injection and they're all on the same three hosts. And we looked into it a bit more and we realized that the shared hosting providers had dodgy permissions set up on their network share, which meant that this account here could read the files in every single other account across their network file share across their entire fleet. Um, which meant that all you had to do is compromise one of the accounts and then iterate through every account, read all the database credentials, and you got database access. Um, and full database access, you can easily act, you know, modify the user's table, create new users, change the passwords, do whatever you want. Um, and so that, that was quite painful. Um, we actually implement, so when we discovered this one and we discovered the host that had this problem, we reached out to them and they're all really responsive. And so they're fixed on something. There's four or five I can remember that we've actually reached out and worked with to fix it. Um, and it's part of our standard site cleaning process now. So when we analyze the site to clean it, we'll actually check for this vulnerability. And if we find it, we'll reach out to the host directly and get them to fix it. And as I said, they've all been really responsive when we've, when we've told them about it and explained why it's a problem. Um, it's a bit hard to read on the screen, but this I discovered this one day. Yeah, that's really hard. One day I was cleaning the site, and in one of the directories, these are all symlinks for wpconfig.php pointing to all of the accounts on that server. So this is the patient zero account. And so the account, they ran a script that iterated through all of the different accounts on the server, and it created symlinks to all of the account config, the wpconfig files in that one directory. And then they used HD access to enable directory listing. So the control server running you know, in their own infrastructure just has to hit the, the directory listing and go through every single page, harvest all the database credentials, and they can connect to all the databases and do whatever they want, gives them full access. Um, and if you can see down here, if it's visible, there's a configuration.php. Um, so it wasn't just targeting WordPress. There also, I think that's Joomla maybe, I can't remember exactly which one that is, but you know, they were targeting multiple CMSs, all the common ones running on shared hosting. Um, it was a very profitable attack for them, I assume, but all they did was database injection, which was quite easy to clean. So, you know, they could have done a lot worse. So, I mentioned that the backups, and backups are essentially doesn't, you know, you, you could accidentally delete some files or something could happen, but they're also really useful when cleaning sites. Um, and what we try and do when cleaning sites is take a full backup before we touch anything. One day I discovered a site that had about 80 gig of uploads, and the FTP was really slow, the um, file manager was really slow and painful, and I decided I couldn't see any malware in the file itself, folder itself, so I figured I'd just move it out and then delete the infected files, put the clean files out there and not have to worry about backing up 80 gig. And then the um, file manager timed out and I deleted a bunch of customer files. So yeah, the takeaway from that one is always do backups, and even if it's going to take forever, just do it anyway. Um, I think, you know, you can explain to a customer, I'm trying to do a backup, it's going to take a couple of hours, but the danger is if I don't do it, you might lose files. So, you know, there's a trade-off there, but you've got to, you've got to take the backups. Um, it's, it's fun contenting customers saying, I've accidentally, you know, five gig of your 80 gig of uploads. So the next question, the next thing is, you know, why access logs are also very important. And can anyone tell me why access logs? Yep. Um, something a bit more than that. Can you expand on why that's helpful? Yeah. Yeah, so if, just for the recording, it's so you can see you know, who's doing what and what they're doing. Um, and so here we've got um, some logs from a fake theme upload that we discovered. Um, so when I was cleaning the site, I found that picture slash db.php file, which was infected. And so I was looking in in the logs to figure out what was going on. And we can see at the top there that the attacker has logged in. So there wasn't any sign of brute force in here at all. So they used um, maybe um, reused, you know, reused a password somewhere. And so they, the attacker tried a password that had been in a password dump, or it was a really simple password or some other method of compromise. But so the attackers logged in to the admin section and they've gone into the theme uploader, uploaded their theme, and then there's their file. So now the attacker has site which allows them to do whatever they want. It also happens quite a lot with plugins. So again, the attacker is logged in via the login form at the top, and they go to the plugin install, they upload their own plugin, and they activate the plugin so they can use it, and then at the bottom they're testing to see if the plugins work. Notice in here we've got Kismet. So this is a fake Kismet plugin, and we sell it all the time. It's the most commonly 
fake plugin that we see. You know, you'll see a Kismet, Kismet 3.2, Kismet 2. Point whatever, Kismet some number. Um, and because it's default, everyone just ignores it. They see a Kismet on their site and go, oh, it's supposed to be there. And so you often find fake plugins called a Kismet. Um, and there's a couple others to get things, I'll come what they're called. But yeah, so it's quite common. Um, and so in this one, they uploaded their fake plugin and then they checked to make sure it worked. And then they kept going. So what they're doing here is they're getting it to upload, they're updating their own malware essentially. So what was installed by the, the plugin uploader was a very, very basic um, entry point. And so they've kept it nice and simple to try and get past any sort of scanners or firewalls that would check the upload. And then once they've got their code in, then they can get their code to go out and download the payloads they want. And so they're, they're here they're downloading the payload for a, a WP update file. And they're saving it as WP update in the root directory. And as you can see at the bottom here, they kept updating their malware. So if you check out the dates here, they're updating their own malware multiple times a day to do whatever it is they want to do. You know, maybe they're changing source IPs or destinations or something. Um, and they kept doing that until we got inside and we cleaned out the malware. Um, so it's quite interesting that malware gets updated more frequently than plugins. Um, <laughs> so always, always funny. Um, and you can see different iterations of the code as well. You know, some people are really good at writing very good, nice structured malware code. It's really weird. And then other people just don't seem to care about indents or comments or anything. It's just, it's just a mess. So, you know, different authors, different code, right? Um, but yes, yeah, so that, was, that was quite an interesting one. And here's something a bit different in that what they've done here is they look for a fresh install that hasn't actually been run yet. And so they've found the setup config page and it's waiting for a user to install WordPress. And so they've gone through the setup config and they've connected to their own database. They don't need to care about the database and the shared hosting account. They're not interested in that. What they want is to get a file on the server. So they've gone through the setup, connecting to their database, and then they log in as their admin account that they just created in their setup, and then they're uploading their plugin. So they've updated, uploaded and activated their plugin in there, and they're running it. Um, and so what we often see in this scenario is they'll get in by the setup, they'll set it up to their database, they'll upload their malware, and then they'll remove the config file and clean it up. And it will look like it's a fresh install waiting to be installed, but really there's malware already on the site. And so you'll eventually come along and install your WordPress and it'll be infected already. And you won't know, have any indicators of the fact it's infected because they've, they've hidden it. Um, and if you can see the time steps here, I think it's about four minutes. So we've got here, well, 1454 up there, down here is 1458. So total of four minutes it took them to, just to find this, it set it up, install their malware, and then they clean it out at the end. Um, and so, you know, if, if they manage to find your site when you've uploaded the files and you're about to, to run the setup, say you're looking for the database credentials or something, this could happen while you're not even noticing. So it's really important to be ready when you're going to install WordPress to do it immediately, or even throw it behind an IP block or something. Some method of protecting it prevents someone from getting in and I'm installing it before you get to it. Okay, so um, my favorite malware. This sounds a fun one. So one day I was doing what I thought was a typical site clean. First step um, was install WordPress and run the high sensitivity scan, which you know, checks everything it can find, looking for common things, some of the base64 base decoding functions, etc. And I found absolutely nothing, which, which happens occasionally. Usually that's because there's new malware on the site, and that's one of the reasons why we download the files to a cleaning server to run it on there separately. Um, and we harvest the new malware to improve our scanner. So I copied the files over to the cleaning server and I found three changed files. So these aren't new files, they're not random files, they're files that WordFence should have found that were changed, but WordFence thinks they weren't changed. But the cleaning server did find they were changed because it, it runs separately. And so the question is, why did WordFence miss these changes? Mm, close, close. What were you going to say? They're in the files from or they're Yeah, you're pretty close. Um, so this is what was in the WP scanning file. Um, as you can see at the top, they have um, removed the files from the known files list. So this is the list of files that WordFence knows about and it hashes for. So the three files they changed, they've removed from the list. And then they're hashing the class WP upgrader file and throwing the new hash in there. So essentially they're telling WordFence, the hash for the file, it's the same as the hash we've got. And so WordFence will go, it's fine, and move on. Which is very sneaky. So the question is, why were they doing that? So I looked in WP blog header, and it's a bit hard to read, 
Um, at the top, we've got a bit of conditional, but what it's doing is when a request comes in that doesn't meet their condition, so basically checking for a user agent and such, then it grabs the full request and then it sends it to their server. And their server will process that, return some output, and the code will return what they've sent and die and end there. And so what they've got is they've got a copy of the site cached on their server, which has been modified slightly. And any request you make to this account is going to grab their copy and return it. It's not going to execute any more PHP code, any more WordPress at all. It's going to return their copy. And they were, on their server, they were carefully modifying the site to add in, in this case, it was, or the first case I found, it was adding a new drop menu. And in that, had some SEO spam links. But it was carefully hidden, and it was fully themed in the site, so it took me a while to notice it. Um, and so the idea here is, that here is that if you're looking at the site and you find you know, a spam link, and you search for that in the source code, it's not there, because none of it's there on the server itself. It's all running on their server. And they must have a fairly impressive setup, because basically they're turning all of their infected sites into proxies, pointing towards their server, which is serving on the sites. And so they're crawling the sites that they're serving, grabbing the content, and they're modifying them. Which is quite sophisticated, really. You can see why they're trying to hide from WordFence, given the amount of effort they're putting into to infecting the site, returning infected and modified pages. And the third file they modified was the class WP upgrader, which is quite nifty. So the top bit there, they're watching for any WordPress updates, and they're removing the class WP upgrader file and the WP blog header file from the update. So those files won't be updated. And they're the two files that they've modified in WordPress. And then at the bottom, they're looking for WordFence updates or uploads. And they're updating the WF scanner engine file with their own custom payload, the thing we looked at first. And so they're, they're allowing WordFence to update, but then they're modifying the scanner to ignore those files. And they're just not letting the WordPress files update. Um, so we can break sites if um, there's enough changes in those two WordPress files. But if WordFence changes, it'll just try and um, update the file anyway. So that was very clever, and it gets around the problem that some malware has where when you go to an automatic update or update a plugin or something, it can wipe out the malware because if you've modified the core file and the file's updated in the update, it's gone. So they're bypassing that, which is quite nifty. So there's a lot of, a lot of thought has gone into this malware. So um, you can see why I love it. Um, <laughs> no idea who wrote it. Um, be interesting to meet them one day. If anyone here wrote it, you know, I'll, yeah, um, I don't know, come find me afterwards or something, and I promise I won't hit you. Um, so this malware continues to update, to, to evolve. So we update WordFence to detect it and block it. You know, we've changed our known files list and the way we handle hashes and a few other things around to try and detect it. And so they update their malware to, by, to bypass our block and evade detection. And it keeps going round and round and round. <laughs> Like so. Yeah, and so you know, because WordFence is running, has WordFence codes in the site, they have access to modify it. And clearly, they're running WordFence on their test site. Um, current status, as far as I know, one of our um, current analysts shared this with me um, a couple of days ago, is that we're winning um, at this point, where WordFence is detecting the latest iteration of their code. Um, that may change now, it may change tomorrow, who knows. OK, so something a bit different. Um, sometimes you'll find code that looks like this. Um, anyone see what's going on here? Was that sorry? Cleaning? No. I think it's what you all. No. I'm trying to see where the comments are. Can <laughs> <laughs> you just highlight the comments first? <laughs> That's the next slide. <laughs> yeah. All right, fine. Code highlighting. Can you see it now? It's all comments except for a few bits. And to make it a bit more obvious, that's the code that isn't commented. And if we condense it again, we get that. So. What we've got here is they're using creative comments to try and hide those two functions. Um, Base64 decode and assert are commonly used in malware. Base64 decode because you can um, Base64 encode a payload, you know, PHP code, etc., into a nice string and then send it via a get parameter or something, or via any other method. Get a past um, basic scanners. And assert is used because it functions basically the same as eval. And for some reason, malware authors seem to think that we don't know this. 
And so they'll always use assert instead of eval, thinking that we won't look for assert, which is just stupid because we know both of them when we look for both. So why use assert when eval works? Um, what's that, sorry? Mm. Um, yeah, so that's kind of funny. But the interesting thing about this is um, once, we, once you find it, it's very easy to write a signature for it because you've got to look for code, closing comment, more code, opening comment, code. And if we look back here, there's a number of lines where that would match it. So, you know, once we find it once, it's very easy to find. But it's quite a creative, creative way of hiding the malware in, a, um, in plain sight, essentially. And sometimes you just get malware that's just weird or funny. So in this one, we keep finding this one pop up. This malware author keeps quoting Harry Potter. And every time we find it, it's a different bit of Harry Potter. I, I'm pretty sure they're just working their way through the series. And every new bit of malware they put, it's got more Harry Potter on it. So. And they're also manually typing it out by hand, because sometimes there are typos in it as well, which is funny too. Um, yeah, so that, that, that one's always fun to find. OK, and um, we had the epic tale of the persistent attacker that almost thwarted us completely. So this was a, this was a fun one. Um, it started off like normal, your customer site's infected, and so we clean up the site. Access logs enabled, so we enabled access logs. And we sent the report to the customer, we advised them that, you know, change their passwords. Um, we didn't know how they'd got in because we didn't have access logs, we couldn't find any information about that. Customer was happy, they changed their password. One week later, they were reinfected. Like, great, okay. So we have a 90 day, um, you know, guarantee on our cleaning, so it's fine, we'll happily clean a reinfected site. So we clean it again. Um, we looked at the new malware to see, maybe we missed it the first time. Is it possible that we found it now because we've got some new signatures and we hadn't found it before? But no, it was new malware that we hadn't seen before. So it was definitely a reinfection rather than simply missing something. We checked the access logs that we had enabled for malicious activity, but there was nothing in there that showed how it was created. So there, we could see the malware was being accessed, it was being used, but it lined up with the creation dates of the malware, nothing that made sense for how the malware could have actually got there again. And we, because we enabled access logs at the end of the cleaning, we had the full history of when, you know, when, when it would have been created. We knew it was created in that window. So we had a very limited set of logs, which made that bit easy, but we still found nothing. Looked in the database, there were no, no injections, no changed passwords, anything like that that could indicate that they're getting in by the database somehow. You know, one theory was that they could be Changing user user password, then logging in, uploading something, but nothing in there. Next thing we did was look at plugins for malicious behaviors. So maybe there's a plugin that's carefully hiding a malware payload delivery system. Maybe it's running um, you know, crons to, uh, to replace malware every week or something strange like that. But there's nothing in the, the plugins that was suspicious at all. Now, they were running on cPanel. So cPanel has, a, um, it logs your um, logins to the cPanel interface and also logs FTP activity as well. And so check those, there was no active FTP activity and there were no suspicious logins. It just showed our IPs and it showed the customer's IPs. There was nothing else there. So they weren't getting in via cPanel and the customer had changed the cPanel password as well. So it limited that area. Um, so we were out of ideas. We weren't sure how they could have, you know, what was going on here. So we cleaned the site and we watched it, kept an eye on it to see what was going on. It was reinfected within minutes of putting the new file up there. It's like, great, what do we do now? So we, we, at this point, we were wondering if maybe the problem isn't the site code or the database, but there's something wrong with the server. Maybe the server's infected or compromised, or there's some dodgy permissions somewhere. So we deleted all of the files from the public HTML directory. So come, let's see what happens. Now it was created in the directory. So it's definitely not the site that's a problem. It's something to do with the server. So we deleted it again and we watched it very, very closely to see what was going, see if we could notice anything about the, behavior, the activity of the malware or anything else. We saw that. This is the Vim swap file. So the attacker is logged into the server via something. We realized, oh, this host supports SSH. So some hosts have SSH, but they don't tell you. And you've got to troll through pages and pages and pages of documentation to find the obscure port to get in via SSH. And clearly the attacker knew about this. Um, we learned it. Um, and as you can see here, they've got a whole bunch of connections open um, by Tor, and they're keeping it connected. And so anytime one of them drops out, they'll just reconnect another one. They'll recreate the, uh, you know, the authorized keys password, um, authorized key for SSH key, et cetera, to get in. Um, and because we were a basic user, you know, what could we do? How could we get them out? 
Any ideas what we did? Yep. We asked the hosting provider to kick everyone off the server at Fire SSH. So we, um, we changed all the passwords and we removed the keys and they kicked everyone out of SSH and it got rid of them. Took some effort though. Um, talking to the host was fun, having to coordinate, yes, we do have access and go through all their process, but you know. We got there eventually, so that was quite a good feeling when we got them out and the site wasn't reinfected and as far as I know, they've been fine ever since, so that was good. Okay, and just to finish on, um, often when you're doing when you're cleaning up, you want to look at the malware, you want to figure out what's going on. Um, and so, but you'll find malware authors will wrap their malware in, say, Base64 encoding to try and hide it to make it harder for scanners and harder for you to figure out what's happening. And sometimes it feels a bit like this, where you'll come across the malware and it'll be encoded, so you'll decode it. And it'll be encoded again. So you'll decode the next layer and the next layer, and you kind of get a bit frustrated at some point in there. <laughs> And it keeps going, and it keeps going. At the very end, it's something so trivial, it's why bother? <laughs> Thank you.